My story is about a journey I had in researching wheat over a hundred years. It's a story about, begins with William Farrer, who we know for his, sorry, just a bit nervous there. It begins with William Farrer, who we know for his crossbreeding of wheat through to the wheat innovation research at CSIRO today. So why is this a journey? I say a journey because for me, researching wheat is something I'd never done before, but also it took me to lots of areas that I'd never studied before, and also my friends thought that the project would be really boring, looking at wheat. <laughs> However, when they saw some of the results that I made, they were really captivated by that. So it begins with William Farrer, wheat experimentalist, who some of you will know maybe from him being on the $2 bill, or maybe from the exhibition that's in the National Museum, or perhaps from his statue that's in Queenbian, or even his resting place in Lambrig with his wife Sarah. It was really exciting to be working with his artifacts and his letters that he wrote all over the world and his notebooks and his field diary. If that wasn't interesting enough, I found that in the uh, archives of uh, film and television and sound to see a Farrah story and a nation is built. It's really inspiring to hear those words, his objective, wanting Australia to be amongst the wheat growing nations, but also to be the best quality of wheat in Australia. So I had a hundred years to think about, and I'm not a scientist, I'm an artist. And although I don't know a great deal about science, I really enjoyed it at school. However, my maths wasn't really up to scratch. But I enjoyed experimenting and documenting things. So when I approached this project, I met with Dr. Matthew Morell at CSIRO, and I showed him these sketches that I'd done, my ideas for projections of big wheat growing inside Questacom. And Matthew looked at these and said, why? Which really threw me, actually, because the whole project was about wheat. <laughs> so I said to Matthew, well, what should I have brought you? And he said, holes. And I thought, wow, this guy's more abstract than me. <laughs> and I'm actually the artist. So. But what he was talking about is air bubbles inside bread. So I started at CSIRO, and my counterpart there was Dr. David Lavelle, who specializes in research in biological data. And it was David that influenced me in thinking about a third dimension to my work and constructing images spatially. However, the thought of working with numbers and scientific data was a little bit daunting, and but it was really quite exciting at the same time. There were many deflection points along the way because of the diversity of the subject. Uh, but what I'd really like to share with you is that exploring ideas is really exciting, and, and although you might have a plan in hand, there are lots of things that actually pop up and change that direction, but that's actually an adventure in itself. I did have a plan, and the plan was that usual thing of, you know, working with uh, history, artifacts, beginning, growth and development, and thinking about future foods. However, spending time with a scientist was really quite exciting. Listening to their research, even though some of it kind of went way above my head, but what I found in, that, in, in the discussion with the scientist is that my sketchbook, which was a research lab book, was a really good tool in expanding that discussion. And in fact, it's those ideas that were shared and that trust of each other's research ideas and respect for each other's intellectual property that helped me think about where I wanted this work to go. I spent six months with scientists researching this topic, but I want to come back to my idea in thinking about the whole concept. So I invented this word, stelloscope, 
because the amount of information was so big, so many things to look at, and yet I needed to bring it down to one thing, which was an artwork. And also, the scientific data was vast, it was really complex, and I needed to bring that complexity to a simple understanding. And also to make it kind of a spectacular aesthetic. In fact, the brief given to me was just make it wow. So it's a bit hard to interpret. So what were the elements involved in this project? There was William Farrer and his artifacts. There was CSIRO, seeds, bioinformatics, um, entomology. There was the venues, Questacon, Discovery Center. There was the national capital itself, such as the library, even the war memorial, and the film and sound archives. There was a commercial industry, a bakery, and a mill and also the stakeholders, such as um, the William Farrer Trust, and also the local government and the centenary. But to bring all this work and thinking about how I might use 100 years of information, I also had to think about it in terms of how would that look if we're going from early century to now, and how technology has changed as well. So I started looking at early animation and film and thinking about how we used to have things going round in the mirrors, and I had the wheat going round. As you can see here, there's wheat going round in those little mirrors. Whoa. But I want to come back. So I'll just go back. I want to go back because it reminded me of being a child and having one of those kaleidoscopes. And looking in that kaleidoscope and seeing all those shapes go round, and wishing that I could be inside that kaleidoscope, experiencing that movement and touching those shapes inside. And I guess this is how I approached this project. It wasn't about a telescope and looking afar, or even having a microscope and looking inside. It was really about having that kaleidoscope and seeing those things go around, bringing things together so it would be one big, exciting picture. That's the wheat inside the kaleidoscope there. So what were the things that brought this together? Well, there was the wonderful William Farrer. Can you hear that crisp noise? Being in the library and turning the pages of his notebook, just the age of those pages and working with his, with his letters, and to find the carbon paper inside that held all those words as he carbon copied all his letters that he wrote and to feel that this held his words and maybe even formulas of his experiments. It was really overwhelming to be filming the actual field diary that's preserved. When you open this diary, it's so brittle and you can see his writing. And in fact, I didn't expect to be overcome with such kind of awesomeness being in front of this artifact. In fact, for me, that was the real wow. Being at CSIRO gave me the opportunity to be in those fields of wheat. And as the crops grew, I really wanted to film the sound of that wheat. So I actually got the camera and hooked it up to my son's scooter, the scooter from when he was little. And I took that scooter inside the fields and threw the wheat, and you could hear it scratching on the lens and the camera, which I know you shouldn't do. But it was really, you just wanted to hear that crisp sound on the camera itself. I had the opportunity to work with a scientist. It had taken him five years to bring his seeds to this experiment, to actually plant in the ground. And I saw those seeds grow into the wheat plants. And that was something quite special documenting his journey. I learned that Retaining dormancy helped prevent early germination in plants and the importance of the colour blue and that colour blue inside the labs. By now, I was constructing 3D images of my own crops. I started to make my own virtual crops and I developed a simple rule set so I could take 2D images into 3D structures. With Chong Nguyen, we started reconstructing plants of wheat, well, 
actually these aren't wheat, these are cotton, and also tiny insects. This was part of Chong's research at the Australian National Insect Collection. For me, I wanted to look at the wheat weevil as a pest to grain storage. But for Chong, the challenge was to reconstruct a tiny, tiny insect, as you can see here. It took us to, whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was really exciting when we were able to put these insects all over QuestCon in one Enlightened Festival. And also to see these insects crawling all over entomology building at CSIRO as if they were really trying to escape. What we learnt from this is about scale and detail in reconstructing insects, but also to experiment with materials such as 3D titanium printing. It was a material so apt that we found the insects themselves to be as tough as metal when we had to dissect them for this process. These 3D iridescent critters became a popular feature for press in bringing attention to scientific research. And as we developed our scanning processes and used software such as Dristi, we could actually go inside these insects, which was really important for the entomologists who could only determine their gender by looking inside the insects. It was really exciting to see headlines in the newspapers that Cyro creates giant bugs and that Canberra is invaded by insects. As you can see, it's, it's really exciting to see science and art working together and that an artist and a scientist really can bring together some exciting results. It's very fruitful and productive and really important about having these relationships between science and art. I argue and have argued with others, that science and art are creative catalysts in, in developing creativity and imagination, and that interdisciplinary organizations, I argue that they, the artists should be part of those teams. Going back to Matthew's ideas of the holes, and knowing more now about the commercial baking processes, I decided that it would be really interesting to develop a human loaf. And that to talk about the benefits of eating bread in the exhibition would be great to have this human loaf inside the exhibition. So I contacted the bakery and said this was my idea and they thought I was really crazy. <laughs> and they also said if you did create this large loaf you'd need a huge tin and also it wouldn't work because you'd have the toes burning and the head burning and that wouldn't really represent good baking processes. However, I did find a design company that said they could make such a tin. And we did think of a kiln, which was a much better idea than my original process of thinking we might have to go to the crematorium and use their kind of... <laughs> you know, I did actually think of that. Apparently, you can't adjust the temperature, so... <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> but I did follow through with the idea, and I did make my five slices of human-sized bread. Sorry. I'll just flip back so you can see them again. There they are. There's actually, they're in the Discovery Center now. So the exhibition was to be at Questacon, and the amount of material I had now was so huge, and this had to be in the auditorium, which is very bright and difficult for projection. So I created these hemispherical projection systems, which you can see on the bottom that could hold all that content of William Farrow, my plants, scientists' research, and, and the audience could interact with them by casting their body and their hands over these systems, and then it would reveal the different layers of content underneath. As you can see here, they're, they're all the films that are contained in, in those systems. I also had the opportunity to work, sorry, with a composer, Madeleine Radish. And with my films and her ideas of working with the DNA uh, sequence of wheat, we actually, she developed the composition for Stelloscope. And that really provided another dimension to the exhibition, which really intrigued the audience in listening to the different levels of sound and the things that she put into them. So the exhibition itself inside the gallery had 
holograms, and the today the 3D holograms really do project things quite afar. So the kids were running around and trying to grab things from these holograms. They were trying to grab the seeds from them. And then alongside of that, we had the floor. And here I created the seeds, the high-density scans, that when you walked on them, your body cast a shape and revealed the wheat of field underneath. This stood next to the domes with all the content that I've just talked about with William Farrer. And here you can see the 200 plus strings that when the light projected of the laser scans detecting how climate change has affected the wheat fields, it was like a magic show, seeing those beams of light with 3D structures of wheat. As you can see, this was really a, st a telescopic vision. And for me, it was like being inside that kaleidoscope, seeing all those things come together. What I hope is that you will all have the chance to have a kaleidoscope story and that your story will forever change and have new pictures. Before I go, I just want to leave you with a picture of those domes. <laughs>